Uh, but there's also that idea that language adapts and we may need to adapt with it. And so we're going to have that vote right after benediction about whether you'd like to go with this one. So if you're saying this today or singing this today at service, please think about that. Whether you want to go back to the traditional one, think about that, or whether you want to blend them. Uh, so that vote will take place later in the service today. And also, please really count that it's important uh, that the congregation is asked to vote and to decide about how you want to worship God. Uh, it's not any authority of the church, it's not the church cabinet, it's not the pastor, it's, it's not anybody in authority over the congregation, it is the congregation that has the privilege and responsibility of deciding that something that's important is how you want to address God. That is essential to uh, the UCC and the congregational way, and, and I hope you take that uh, privilege and responsibility seriously. So let us now turn to our opening hymn. I'd invite you to please stand if you are able uh, for our opening hymn, which is Come Christian, Join and Sing, Blue Hymnal number 87. We are unable to live up to our full potential as the people of God 
with not turning to you every day. We need you in our lives, and we are blessed to have you in them. There are others, however, who do not share in this blessing. May you call upon us and use us in your way of reaching out to them. May we in this community of the church be enthusiastically welcoming. May we seek to grow in our own faith by imitating your eagerness to restore wholeness and holiness to all of creation. And now let us share in the singing of the glory of God. Baseball, 
plus with school and everything else, and going to church, she just doesn't have the time to do both baseball and piano. And so she's kind of torn. What is she going to do? What choice is she going to make? And so our little imaginary friend Katie, she came up with a very simple plan. And all that is, is just took a piece of paper, wrote piano on one side and baseball on the other, real simple. It doesn't matter really for us what she chose. Uh, I'm sure for Anthony it makes a big difference that she would have chosen you know, the piano, but it doesn't make any difference to the story whether she stayed with the piano or whether she went to baseball. But she took all of the different pros and cons and she wrote them on a piece of paper and it helped her to make a decision. Church, Jesus, prayer, how you're going to act in your daily life, the things that you think are important, the things that maybe are really intrusive, those are all choices. And that's what you heard today a little bit, and you'll hear some more later. Uh, Paul had to make a choice. Was he going to stay the way he was, or was he going to change and follow Jesus? When Paul went around preaching, he came across this young guy, Timothy. And Timothy had made a choice. Am I going to follow Paul and Jesus, or am I going to stay the way I am? And so every day, you've got choices. And you know this even in your young lives. Every day, you've got choices between doing what you think is the right thing to do and choices about what the bad thing is to do. You've got to make a choice where you're going to, where you're going to put your emphasis. Am I going to do the right thing, which may be very hard? Am I going to do the other thing that maybe is easier, but you just know in your heart it's not the right thing to do? So almost like this kind of pad, you've got to figure out in your life you know, the good and the bad and the choices about do I follow Jesus? Do I go to church? Do I read the Bible? Do I say my prayers? Do I act like a good person? Am I helpful to somebody who's, you know, got no friends in school? Am I nice when somebody else is being picked on? Do I say, you know, stop that? Do I do the good things in life? Or do I choose not to? So every day, even in your lives, even in our lives, there are always going to be choices to be made. So we're asking you at church, we're asking you through uh, Mrs. Field Sunday school class, we're asking you to kind of take the time to think through those choices and to give Jesus a chance to be a real part of your life by choosing Jesus at least some of the time, if not most of the time, if you're a really good person, saint, all the time. But at least give Jesus a chance to be a part of that choice-making process. Okay? Thank you very much for being here, and enjoy Sunday school. Choir's back to rehearsing on Wednesday nights at 6.40. If anybody's interested in joining us, a choice. come on by. <laughs> yeah, 6.40. Bring a friend.
thanks, Anthony, and thanks, Claire. Now time for us to share in our prayers, and before we get to our yellow sheet, uh, let's just continue our prayers. Um, as Irene mentioned at the very beginning, today is the 21st anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks on our nation. We remember those who died, we remember all those who were injured, we remember the heroics of that day. We also remember all those who are, were and are still traumatized by that day. Uh, we pray that uh, there may be healing in all sorts of ways here in our nation and really around the world. And we pray also for the people of Ukraine. Uh, there is still war going on in that, that nation that is, you know, just doesn't need to be going through all this, but it is. Uh, we pray for them. We pray for peace there. We pray for peace wherever uh, war is seen as the best option, which is just absolute foolishness. And so we do pray for the people of Ukraine somehow they may get out of that situation. We pray for our nation as we face the reality of persistent and institutional racism. And we also pray for all those who have been affected by COVID-19, literally hundreds of millions who have been infected and those who have died. We pray for continuing progress against uh, this disease. Are there anybody in this congregation in the building, uh, first of all, who would like to share a joy, a celebration, or a concern? Yes, Crystal. So trusted in such a good shepherd, 
We ask that our prayers be heard and answered as you alone know God. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And may we now share together in the prayer that Jesus gave to all of us the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
1 through 10. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners, they were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and he even eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me. For I have found the coin that I have lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. May the words in my mouth and meditation of our hearts together be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. You all know that this summer has been extremely dry, drought conditions actually. But this past week it rained so hard that parts of Interstate 95 in Rhode Island it flooded, and cars were submerged. I, I'm sure you saw the pictures in the news. They were submerged up to their windows, and 95 is so busy. I can only imagine the traffic woes that that would have created. And, it, and it's like, it's either drought or flood. There's no really nice, gentle rain. It's drought or flood all across this nation. And that's because it seems that storms are stalling, and they're dropping humongous amounts of rain in some small areas, but areas just outside of that, nothing. Drought. And I heard that the price of beef is dropping in the supermarkets because ranchers are having to cull their herds because there's no water. The water means no grass, no grain. And so they can't support their farm, their stock, and so off they go. They have to cull the herds. And right now, that's led to a glut and hopefully bringing the price of beef down but before too long, once that's all gone, and there's a lot fewer cows, that price is going to skyrocket because there's just no rain in a dependent kind of way. And it's been unusually hot around here this summer, as you know, but not as bad as it is right now on the West Coast. I thought I was going to die on some of those days when it hit 100 degrees. I hated it. I couldn't stand it. But there are places out West that aren't used to it at all, and it's hitting 115 degrees. People are actually dying. They're not just uncomfortable. They're dying, literally dying from this kind of heat. And it's bad, and it's going to get worse over the coming years. The National Weather Service is talking about giving names to heat waves because they're hoping that people will take the heat waves more seriously that way, kind of like naming hurricanes. So heat waves cause more death in our country, and I did not know this, but heat waves cause more death in our country than any other natural event and it's going to get hotter, so that's going to get worse. More people are going to die. We have hurricanes that are becoming more and more destructive. Fires are getting larger, and wildfire season is extending almost right up until winter. So there's also what's called a doomsday glacier. It's in Antarctica. It's the size of Florida, and it's, and it's melting, and it's sliding off the ground more quickly than they and they figured that this decade, that could drop into the sea. If that happened in this decade, water levels around the world could rise between 3 and 10 feet. Imagine what that does to a city like Boston. Imagine what that does to Cape Cod. Imagine what that does to anybody on the coast anywhere in the world. And scientists have been warning us about climate change for decades now. And now we're living it. And climate isn't our only global problem. The war in Ukraine has brought nuclear war back into talk. I can't believe it. There's talk of nuclear war. When they talk about Russia, they use nuclear weapons. There's also that nuclear power plant that is being bombed. Nuclear weapons, nuclear power plants being destroyed. And there are no limited nuclear wars, no limited nuclear accidents. If it happens in one place, it could affect all of us. Plus, all of these wars and climate disruptions are forcing lots of populations to be on the move and to migrate. 
It's added to a lot of political tensions around the globe, even right here in our country, as you know. And let's not forget how quickly and globally our current pandemic and maybe our next pandemic spread. One little place in China, one thing on the news, within a few months it was here in our country and we're still living with it now in 2022, three years later. It's going to happen again. And so are we prepared for stuff like this? Well, the New York City College professor, he's, he's watching all of this in the news, and he's thinking about it. His name is Douglas Rushkoff, and he's written a book. It's called Survival of the Richest, Escape Fantasies of the Tech Billionaires. And it's about the hopes of those with more money than they know to do with who are planning to save themselves by separating themselves from us. It seems preposterous, but he writes about the plans of people like Elon Musk, who is wanting to escape global calamities by leaving for another planet, Mars. He's talking about Mark Zuckerberg, who's creating an alternate metaverse. So if you can't go outside and enjoy a tree, you can put on some kind of mask and you can enjoy a tree in the metaverse. Or Ray Kurzweil from Google, who's actually talking about taking our consciousness all those brain firings that are going on up in our head constantly, you know, keeping us awake and alive and alert, taking that and uploading it into some kind of supercomputer. So if we can't live here, we can live in some kind of supercomputer. This isn't science fiction. This is what tech billionaires are talking about. And these are their attempts to separate from the doom that they see as inevitable. And this seems just the wrong track to me. This idea of trying to separate and hide away just a few people from the rest of us and maybe save themselves. Even Homer Simpson, not the brightest bulb on the shelf if you ever watched that cartoon The Simpson. He was safe in Ned Flanders you know, end time bunker, but he didn't want to stay there. Even Homer Simpson didn't want to stay there and save himself if everyone else around him and the world around him died. And Homer Simpson left the security of the bunker get out of it. The reality is that there are global events that we cannot escape. And when we consider the selfish notions of some of these billionaires who are still going to try, I gotta say, I don't think Jesus is as impractical as some people would have him be. Rather, I see Jesus as standing up for our most sensible, our most rational way of surviving. And that's working on all of these problems together. That's what Jesus talked about. Working on all of these problems together. Jesus and his gospel are not about building utopia, some kind of dream world where you can go and live and you know, everything else around the world that goes out here. You're going to live in your little dream utopia. He's not talking about that. He's talking about changing the world. He's not just talking about waiting until we die and go to heaven and God's going to make everything beautiful up in heaven. He's talking about changing the world. And these are about giving us a chance to save ourselves because it's that realization that when we help each other, it's the only way to help us each as individuals. Thinking about the good of the community isn't just selfish or selfless and altruistic. It's the realization that we're all in this together. And there's no other way to deal with it. We can't do it alone. And now this sounds a lot like preaching and more than practical. And when Jesus was preaching, he was trying to get this practical message out to people who listen to him. And he comes up with the gospel that I just read today. And it's outlandish. It doesn't make any sense. When Jesus advocates leaving the 99 sheep alone and unattended and going out to search for the one lost sheep, Everyone who is listening to me, because I've never, I've never, I don't know one chef, sheep herder in my, my whole life. I don't know anybody who herds sheep. But in his day, it would have been common knowledge. And so everyone who heard Jesus knew that when Jesus left to go look for the one, those 99 were in danger of getting lost themselves or getting eaten. Jesus never says in that gospel that he leaves the 99 and care of them shepherd. He never says that he leaves them in a pen. It says he leaves them in the wilderness. Leave 99 sheep alone in the wilderness, and you've got 99 problems. Everyone would have realized this as preposterous. But Jesus knows this, 
Jesus is no fool. Jesus knows human psychology and the intent to this reaction. Jesus is trying to use hyperbole to get this message through all of our logical and practical defenses. And that message is the essential importance of the whole. It is illogical to jeopardize the 99 in search of the one unless Jesus is trying to convince us against all of our protestations up here in our head that the whole is incomplete even by 1%. And if it is incomplete, then it is lost, the whole is broken, the whole is unworkable. You know, I, I don't know if I've ever told you this story, but my parents, they used to have this, this happy tradition. And in the summer, out on their back patio, uh, they would lay out this puzzle, maybe a thousand piece puzzle, a big beautiful thing, maybe some, I don't know, kind of Norman, Norman Rockwell or something kind of pictures. And they would lay that out there, and little by little they would go out to the evening, put a few pieces together. By the end of the summer, they had this big, beautiful puzzle completed. And so when I would go to visit my parents, they would always be out there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and one day, not, I don't know why, I stole one piece of that puzzle. <laughs> and so there's a thousand piece puzzle laying there, and I come in for you know, some visit on a, you know, maybe a Sunday, I come back the following Sunday. I got that piece of puzzle. And, and my parents, I guess, must have gone a little bit nuts because they finished this thousand-piece puzzle. And somewhere in that thousand-piece puzzle, there's a hole. And they're, they're looking everywhere. They're looking at the table. They're looking here. They're looking there. They're wondering what happened to that one piece. And then this kid of theirs shows up, simply puts his hand in his pocket and puts the last piece in the thousand-piece puzzle. They were none too happy about the fact that I had stolen the last piece of the thousand piece puzzle and just simply put it there on my own. I never ever did that again. But the message is, is just like that one lost sheet. That puzzle is useless. 999 interlocking pieces. Without that one piece, I don't care if it's in the center, out in the corner, on the edge, it doesn't matter. Without that one piece, the whole puzzle, broke. You're not going to frame a puzzle with one with this and these. So Jesus is offering the counterintuitive revelation that if we don't survive together, we don't. So put that in the language I started with. It's either we work and figure a way out of our global issues and survive together, or we create fantasies about some kind of individual escape to another planet or into some computer's logic, and then we're all doing it. So Jesus' revelation is the most practical advice offered in 2,000 years. It is really God trying to save us. And it's God saying to us, we have to do this together. And on top of this, I love Jesus' optimism. No one does not matter to Jesus. No one is ignored by Jesus, forgotten, or even worse, pushed aside by Jesus. And what a wondrous gift this is to his church that we are privileged to share that message that everyone matters. This message of inclusion, this message that we call open and affirming. We are called upon to share this healing message that no one doesn't matter to God. That Jesus' invitation is broad and all-encompassing. That Jesus loves to sit with tax collectors and sinners in the language of today's gospel. In other words, the people that religious authorities it just said, you shouldn't be with them, and Jesus loved being with them. When some use religion as an excuse to discriminate, to separate, Jesus just wants to put his hand to his forehead and just say, what in the world are they listening to my gospel? How did they get that message? And so that we may be faithful, authentic, and enthusiastic in our welcome, that we may share the promise that the whole is holy. For this may we pray. Because it's not only about getting into heaven, it's about getting in, giving us a chance to survive right here, right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to please stand if you are able. Our closing hymn today is Red Hymn number 306 for all the sins.